In this video, we'll be deriving the formula that describes Fermat's principle, which basically allows you to predict how light will behave at the interface between two media. However, to derive this formula, we don't need to talk about light in any form. In fact, we'll be using this as an exercise application on derivatives since it's the perfect example of how to translate a problem statement that's written in words to a mathematical formulation which you can then solve. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them down below. And with that said, let's get right into it. And to make this entire derivation less abstract and more tangible, let's consider the following situation. You have a lifeguard that is here at position A, looking over the C. And then this line right here represents the interface between the land on one side, which we denote with an L, and the water on the other side, which we, well, fittingly denote with a W. And at some point, the lifeguard sees some person in the sea that is struggling and therefore in danger. And let's denote the location of this person at point B. And this already brings us to the question that will lead to the Fermat's principle which path from A to B will the lifeguard have to take in order to minimize the time to arrive at point B. And as you probably noticed already, the second part of the question, to minimize time, already reveals to us that we'll have to do something with derivatives, and in particular, optimization. And before we dive headfirst into the problem, let's first define some distances. Let's say that the shortest distance from A to the interface with the water is a distance h. And now the only simplifying assumption that we will make in this exercise is that the shortest distance to the interface from point b, so the drowning person, is also h. So it's the same distance and this will simplify our calculations quite a bit. But at the end I am sure that you will be able to redo the calculations for the case where these distances are not the same. Another distance that is characteristic for this problem is the horizontal distance between point A and point B. And let's indicate this distance by saying that this point right here is at a distance L from this point which we call zero, or the origin of an imaginary x-axis that we choose in this direction. Having named and defined both H and capital L, we can write this point B as follows, namely L, H indicating this horizontal distance L in the X direction and this vertical distance H in the Y direction. And at this point, let's return to the question and focus on this part, the path that the lifeguard has to take. Now, what constitutes a path that the lifeguard has to take? Well, if the lifeguard just goes straight ahead towards the drowning person, that would mean that it would take this path right here, just straight ahead to the drowning person. And for later reference, we call the point by which the path crosses the boundary between the beach and the ocean to be point x. And as you probably already know, this will be our variable, since if x varies in this direction or that direction, the path changes. Now why wouldn't this straight path, where x is exactly l over 2, be the solution to our problem? since the path that takes the least amount of time to travel on is surely the shortest path, right? Well, at this point we need to remind ourselves of a physical property of humans, namely that our velocity in water is oftentimes, for most of us, much slower than our velocity on land. We travel much faster on land because we can run than we can travel through water where we have to swim. This in turn means that the segment of our path that goes through the sea will be traversed at a much slower velocity. Therefore, intuitively, it makes sense to travel a lot longer over the beach, because then our velocity is much larger, and only then dive into the water and go save our victim. And this would mean that our x in that case would be right here. And this is of course all based on intuition and some reasoning. However, we now have a very precise and mathematical statement that we can work with in order to solve this problem. Namely, which x will minimize the time traveled? So where will this x fall between 0 and this l? And in this way, we have translated our problem, which was stated in words, towards a mathematical description which we can now use to solve. 
And in fact, at this point, the hardest part is already done. And now we will set up the derivative that we will actually have to calculate. And the first step in doing so is to define the distances of the path that we travel on. The first segment of our path will be from our starting point at A all the way over land to the X that we are looking for, the X at the interface between the land and the water. And this segment of our path will be all over land. So we will have the velocity that we have on land, so a much larger velocity. Now the distance traveled on this path, let's call this large x with a subscript L from the distance traveled on land. And to find this distance, we will do some geometry. We see that the distance that we are looking for, xL, is actually the side of a right angled triangle, namely this one, with this being the right angle. We see that this side has length h, and this side, of course, has length x. Therefore, we can use the Pythagorean theorem to find this distance, namely that this is the square root of one side squared plus the other side squared, in this case x squared. And we already have the distance traveled on land as a function of this x, again the x that we're actually looking for. The second segment of our trajectory will of course be the part that is in the water, so from x all the way to b, our drowning victim. And let's call this distance xw, fittingly, and let's see if we can find this. Namely, it's this distance right here, so the distance from x through our drowning victim, which we call xl. And again, we see that this xl is part of a right-angled triangle, namely this one right here, and it goes up to b and then down again. One side of the triangle is this h, and the other side of the triangle is this distance right here, from x to l. Now, this distance, of course, is l, the entire distance, minus x. So we can, again, use the Pythagorean theorem to find this distance xw, just h squared again, plus, and now something slightly different, namely l minus x squared. And we close the square root. And at this point, we see that we've now written our two segments or the distance of our two segments of our entire trajectory as a function of this x here. So we see that if x changes, then the distance of our trajectory changes. Now this is of course just an intermediate step, because we're not asked to find a minimal distance between our point A and our point B, because that would simply be solved by taking this straight line right here. No, we're asked to find the minimal time that it takes to get from point A to B. And because the velocity on land is different than it is in the water, this straight line will not be the solution. So the next step is to define the time of a specific trajectory. And that is exactly what we'll be doing right now. We know that the velocity is equal to the distance traveled over a specific time. Now this can very easily be rearranged by saying that the time is of course equal to the distance divided by its velocity over that distance. This allows us to define the time of the different segments of our trajectory, the time that it takes to cross distance xl and the time that it takes to cross the distance inside the water, xw. So we have tl, the time over land, which is simply equal to xl over vl. And in the same way, we have, of course, tw is the time spent in the water, which is xw divided by vw. And since the total trajectory is simply the sum of the trajectory on the land and the trajectory on the water, the total time of our trajectory will, of course, be equal to the time on the land plus the time that we spend traversing the water. Now we know, since the distances that are spent on the land and in the water depend on this x right here. We know that this t, which is a function of these distances, will also depend on this x. So these are two functions of x, the variable that we're looking for. And therefore, this total time will also be a function of x. And to make this more explicit, let's write out our complete formula. So we have t of x, which is equal to x land divided by vl, and we know x land 
right here. So this will be the square root of h squared plus x squared divided by the velocity we have on the land, simply vl, and, it's, and this is a constant velocity, plus the part that we spend in the water. So this is the distance we spend in the water, that is the square root of h squared plus, now this second term is l minus x squared, and then we have to divide this, of course, by the velocity we have in the water, which is vw. And at this point, we are, of course, almost done, because we now have a formula of x that we need to minimize. Because if we minimize this formula for x, then we have minimized the time traveled from a to b. And we know, of course, that minimizing a function of a variable x, for example, is the same as deriving this function to this variable x and equating it to zero. And at that point, we have found an extremum, and in this case, it will be a minimum. So this, of course, will be the challenge that we will do right now, simply minimizing this function that we constructed to the variable x, and then putting this equation to zero and solve for x in order to find our final result. And at this point, it is derivative time. And if you are very confident in your derivative skills, then you can skip ahead to the next section in this video where we will briefly discuss the solution that we have found. So we need to derive t as a function of x to the variable x. Now, since t is this function right here, we can do that right away. So the first term is this term right here, which is the time traveled on land. We see that this vl, which is a constant, can be put in front of the derivative or outside of the derivative since it is a constant. Then we simply have the derivative of a square root. Now we of course need to do the chain rule. So first we derive the square root, which becomes one over two times the same square root. So h squared plus x squared multiplied by deriving whatever is inside of the square root, which in this case is h squared plus x squared. If we derive this to x, we simply get 2x. The same can be done for this term right here, the time traveled in the water. We put in front the velocity in the water, and then we derive this square root. We again get 1 over 2 times the square root of h squared plus l minus x squared. And now we do the chain rule, where we first have to derive these brackets, so 2 times l minus x, and then we derive this x, which simply becomes minus 1. And this, in a nutshell, is the derivative. Now we can rewrite this, of course, which we will do right now. First, we note that these factors of 2 cancel each other out, so we don't need to take them with us. Then we find the following. 1 over vl multiplied by x divided by this square root, so h squared plus x squared, minus, because that's this minus that we put in front of this entire thing, 1 over vw multiplied by l minus x divided by this square root of h squared plus l minus x squared. And we close the square root. And because we're looking for an extremum of this function, we need to put this derivative equal to zero and then solve this for a specific x. However, we see that we have these square roots of x's in the denominator, which will make for a very messy calculation to really get x isolated on one side of the equality sign. What we first do is to rearrange this equation such that there is one term on each side of this equality sign. So basically getting this minus term on the other side. So we get on one side one over vl multiplied by x over the square root of h squared plus x squared, which is equal to 1 over vw multiplied by l minus x divided by the square root of h squared plus l minus x squared. And at this point, this is an equation that we need to solve or at least rewrite such that we can get some solution out of this. And to do this, we will briefly sketch our original situation again. So we have our separation between the land and the sea. We have A on this side, which is a distance 
H from the water, we have our drowning person B on that side, which is also a distance H from the water, so this is also H, and this B has a horizontal distance L from our starting point. And then we have this point X, which we are still looking for, which determines at which point we will enter the water, and so at which point our velocity will go from the velocity on land to the velocity on water. We also found that the distance traveled on land is simply equal to the square root of h squared plus x squared. We found this by using the Pythagorean theorem. And we did exactly the same for the distance traveled in the water, for which we got the square root of h squared plus l minus x squared. So why do I now redraw this situation? Well, it is to point you on the fact that these two terms on both sides of this equality sign can be written in a much easier and more simplified way, a more elegant way, if you like. Because we see that this side right here is simply x. That's this one right here. And we see that this side right here is simply this square root, which is in the denominator of this fraction. This means if we write this angle right here as theta 1, then we see that this fraction actually becomes the cosine of theta 1. And therefore, we can rewrite the left-hand side of the equality sign as 1 over the velocity over land multiplied by the cosine of this angle theta 1, which is the angle at which we are entering the water. Now you can of course do exactly the same on the right-hand side, because this distance right here is simply L minus X. And this distance in the water here is of course this denominator. And therefore, if we define this as theta 2, then we can see that the right-hand side can be written as 1 over the velocity in the water multiplied by the cosine of theta 2, which is the angle that we have compared to the boundary between the water and the land. And written in this way, with the angles of inclination, we arrive at Fermat's formula. Now you might not recognize it immediately, but that's only because Fermat's formula is often written with these angles in mind. Let's call them alpha 1 and alpha 2. However, I'm sure that you're smart enough to connect these cosines of theta with the sine of alpha 1 and the sine of alpha 2. And this is how we derived Fermat's formula from a simple optimization problem, namely minimizing the time it takes to go from this point to that point through two different media, meaning where our velocity is different in one part of our trajectory than in the other part of our trajectory. Now we can perform an easy check to see if this formula actually makes any sense. We look at the scenario where the velocity on land is actually equal to the velocity of water. So basically where there is no change in medium. In this particular case, we expect the path that minimizes the time to get from point A to point B to be just the shortest path or just a straight line, meaning that we would want to find that this angle is equal to that angle. So basically these two angles have to be equal to each other. So let's see if that indeed follows from our formula. We have one over VL times the cosine of the first angle, which has to be equal to 1 over Vw times the cosine of the second angle. Now, if the velocities are equal to each other, these two factors can drop out. And we see that we simply have the cosine of an angle has to be equal to the cosine of another angle. And this is indeed, of course, the case if these two angles are equal to each other. And this is just a sanity check to see that this formula indeed makes sense. And this brings us to the end of this video, and I hope that you enjoyed having another application exercise on derivatives, and along the way, you also managed to derive Fermat's formula. If you have any questions, leave a comment in the comments down below, or visit our Discord server. If you learned something, give this video a thumbs up. If you want to get notified by future releases, consider subscribing. And with that, I thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.